Jason Warren Sprouse. You're on the Bible Forum. This is Memorial Day 2017. We're going to spend the next couple of hours together. Love for you to join us live. You can do that from our website, thebibleforum.net. And beginning tonight, you can do it from our Facebook page. It's Facebook Bible Forum, capital B, capital F. If you put the Bible Forum in, you get somebody else. They beat me to it. So it's just Bible Forum. I'd like to give you a little rundown of the kinds of things that sparked my interest this week. Uh, we have a, a national, a, a federal uh, representative, a U.S. representative in our area by the name of Mark Sanford. He used to be our governor, and then he ran off with a woman, and it was a whole big thing. He's back. And he's a U.S. representative. And he's responding to the proposed budget uh, that the Republicans are putting forward. And he says, I quote, I commend the president for looking to balance the budget and put the debt on a sustainable downward path. This proposal would reduce the federal government's footprint by cutting duplicative uh, government programs, reducing improper payments, and focusing funding on the traditional roles of government. That's the good news. The bad news is that while it appears to balance the budget, it's only through a combination of very strong economic forecasting and unrealistic future cuts in domestic, meaning discretionary, uh, spending. It doesn't touch Social Security. It doesn't touch Medicare. Uh, both are on their way to insolvency. It assumes a 3% economic growth uh, with a sustained growth of 4.8% uh, unemployment rate and other or another 10 years of this kind of continuous economic expansion. He calls it very high standards, each given the continued uh, retirement of baby boomers and a slowed private investment. Clearly, he says the budget is based on a very strong uptick in the economy on almost every level. This is offered as criticism, although he would be one who would probably say that he fully expects the economy to be stronger. I know I do. I'm counting on it. I think from what we've seen so far, that this economy is going to take off and it's going to race right up through the roof. I think there'll come a day down the road when we'll want to kind of put a curb on it. And that's if they don't get in there and mess with it. The Senate is big on doing that. Uh, they don't like Trump. They don't like his budget. They don't like anything he's doing. And they're going to make it miserable. Uh, so they're going to pass their own version. The House is then going to have to reconcile. There's going to be something here going on, and then they'll come up with this. But we're going to do this about eight or ten more times uh, over the next eight years. And so let's just watch and see how it goes. The uh, Congressional Budget Office, uh, which Mark Sanford was and others uh, would love to have seen get involved with the budget before it was actually made public, uh, the, the, the CBO, Congressional Budget Office, was wrong when they initially analyzed Obamacare's effect on cost and coverage. And according to HHS Secretary Tom Price, they're wrong again. In defending the House bill passed three weeks ago, he said, quote, in reality, Americans are currently paying more for fewer health care choices because of Obamacare. And that's why the Trump administration is committed to reforming health care. The House Republicans passed the bill three weeks ago without waiting for the CBO to release a score, as they say, on their legislation, in part because the CBO originally projected a 22 million people would enroll in Obamacare exchanges by 2016. Less than half did so. That's not bringing a whole lot of comfort to people. It also replaces an earlier version of the affordable health care that the CBO had said would result in 24 million people being uh, without insurance. Uh, Price believes the figures of those left without insurance being reported is way misleading. He says it, it includes 9 million who already are without coverage under Obamacare. 
The remaining 14 million are made up of those who could potentially lose coverage under the new bill, plus those who lose coverage merely by taking advantage of the AHCA's mandated purchase coverage feature as it's being eliminated, meaning that people who are forced to buy insurance will probably stop. Representative Tom MacArthur has spent 30 years in the health industry, and he said they were off by 120% CBO. He said that's a staggering error. The recently proposed new bill gives consumers more options than they, uh, that they can afford. It gives consumers or gives states more control over the exemptions that force the prices up. It gives insurance companies more options. There's no minimum package requirements now. And it gives tax credits to lower out-of-pocket costs. Overall, they say it reduces the costs and offers more choices. It also lowers the federal deficit by $119 billion with a B. That's a lot of money. What it doesn't do, it doesn't make the government your insurance carrier. It doesn't require you to have a certain level of insurance. It doesn't put elected officials in the driver's seat, meaning a guaranteed stump speech with which to manipulate voters. How much health insurance did the average American have in the 1930s during the Great Depression? What about in the 1950s and the 1960s? My father and, and my father's family all worked for E.I. DuPont de Nemours. They had an insurance program. I worked for them. I had it too. I know how it worked. I didn't have to pay into it. But it only worked if you went to the hospital. Only if you went to the hospital. And then it would pay the bill. Everything else you had to take care of. And that was the premier health insurance in the country, if not in the world. Why did the government not step up and take care of this problem back in the 50s and the 60s if it's so critical? The answer is because such things are inherently personal responsibilities. This is not what government is supposed to be involved in it. So why are they doing it now? Well, they're doing it because Europe's doing it. Europe does it because they're socialists, they're progressives, they, you know, it's a new word. They're socialists, they, they want to socialize everyone. We want to do things. Our government is seeking to take over every aspect of our miserable lives because they think they can do it better. No, because it would then make us, make the government our benefactor, and it would make us beholden to them. It's all about control. If you are responsible, you may actually work at making certain you get a good education or that you would learn a marketable skill, not get a bachelor's degree in liberal arts, or you would develop a talent and ability, something that would feed your family and care for their needs. If you're not responsible, you can continue playing video games, drinking alcohol, doing drugs, having carefree sex with whomever, and living at home with your parents. The government will take care of you, and when you fall, which you will, the government will pick you up. They'll take care of everything, and you'll thank them for it from your government apartment. There was some groundbreaking data released this week by the Journal of American Medical Association an internal medicine from a 35-year-long study. It indicates Americans are living five years longer than they were 35 years ago. That's overall. However, in some parts of America, we're dying 20 years younger. And the difference? Well, largely, if you voted for Donald Trump, you're probably living in the area of the country where people are dying 20 years younger than others. But here's the political point. The data points to the Republican breadbasket of red southern states as faring worst 
in the country in regard to average life expectancy, scoring consistently below national average. In fact, the 20 counties in the highest mortality rates in the country were all from states that Trump won. All this mixed with the alarming increase in mortality rates and despair among middle-class whites and polling suggests that the white working class that voted for Donald Trump did so because they feel like a stranger in their own country. And that should worry people, Republicans and Democrats alike. Get on the bus, Gus. The public is moving. They're fed up. They're worried. What are you going to do about it? Dr. Michael Brown is a charismatic. Uh, he's uh, an educator. I think he was a pastor. He's an author. Uh, he's a teacher. He does a lot of different kinds of things. Writes articles. Right has a blog, uh, a website, and all the. And recently. In an exchange on his Facebook page, Dr. Brown was challenged, challenged by the likes of a Stephen Kozar, uh, Chris Rice, Amy Spreeman, and some others. Now, you may not know those names. Uh, they are largely charismatics. Uh, but he was being challenged to call out false teachers in order to protect his listeners, his readers, from these lousy, terrible doctrines that are being spread. Like what? Well, like the kind of stuff I share with you. I talk to you on a regular basis about Jennifer LeClaire. She writes articles. She's a prophetess and all the rest of it. Uh, Heidi Baker, uh, Benny Hinn, Bill Johnson, maybe not a household name. He's out in, in Cal Redding, California. Uh, in New Apostolic Reformation, crazy charismatic. But nobody was suggesting that Dr. Brown personally attack these people, but they were asking him to compare their teachings with Scripture. These people are out into Never Never Land. And Dr. Brown, for all his credibility, has refused. Strangely, he did not fully endorse these people. Instead, he uses vague generalizations like, well, as far as I know, these are fine Christians. Which really begs the question, does he know what a Christian is? And do Christians follow anything but God's word, God's revealed word, forever settled word that we have in our Bible, not what people's getting messages from Mars? And are their rules of interpretation when reading the written word. Now, these are admittedly pesky questions, but they're questions that need to be asked. Dr. Brown wants to be respected as a very knowledgeable scholar and an expert, but he continually ignores the people and the teachings emanating from within his own movement. He's a charismatic, after all. Dr. Brown promotes these people on his radio show, He's been a guest on Benny Hinn's TV show. So which is worse? Somebody obviously espousing error, they got a tinfoil hat on, they're nuts, or someone who presents as mainstream and yet is either espousing that same error or refusing to condemn it. Of course, the argument is always who's to say what's error. The Bible does, people. The Bible does. Recently, President Trump lifted the ban on political speech in churches. This was a ban that was operating through the tax code, put in place uh, a bill that was put on the floor and uh, eventually voted uh, by then Democrat Senator Lyndon Baines Johnson. It's been part of our income tax code since the 1950s. Uh, it seems that when Lyndon Johnson was running for re-election in Texas, the Southern Baptist Convention must have gotten together collectively and actively worked to try to keep him from being re-elected. The man is a, was a bum, 
I mean, he was one of the most filthy mouth, one of the most disgusting human beings on the planet. He ended up president of, of these United States. Largely, he was getting even. And we've talked about this over the years. How is it that most Christians during this time period or most Americans during this time period really thought that that tax code restriction that said churches couldn't get involved in political things and keep their tax-exempt status, how is it that we bought into that line and bowed to that kind of pressure? If you've been listening to me for any length of time, you know as a pastor, I never did. And I encourage people all over the place to ignore it. It wasn't what people kept telling us it was. Well, we apparently now have a president who understands the concept of separation of church and state, the way the founders intended it. An associate pastor for social justice in a local New York church wants us to be careful, however. He's arguing for a strict interpretation of this separation of church and state, in that church members in the name of their church or denomination must stay out of politics. He views this as the proverbial slippery slope. This is hearkening back to the Lyndon Johnson, the, uh, the 501c3, the, the tax restriction. It's not true. The concept points to state churches telling or influencing state representatives in their votes. It doesn't see individual members or even pastors barred from speaking out against state sanction injustice or for those running for office. We have always been allowed to have political types in our pulpits. You can do that. You've always been allowed to do that as long as you invited them all. And they could have stump speeches in your church if that's what you wanted, as long as you invited them all. No harm, no foul. The black churches did it for years. We always wondered why we can't do it, but the black churches always did it. And they weren't always careful to invite everybody, but nobody said anything, nobody did anything. Well, the law is gone, thank you very much. We'll see how that works. So here's what we know about the third stop on President Trump's tour of major Abrahamic religion sites. In contrast to the leaders of Saudi Arabia and Israel, when our president touched down in Vatican City, the Pope of the Roman Catholic Church did not exactly roll out the red carpet. Did you see it? Did you notice it? Did it strike you? He squeezed the man into a 30-minute slot in an early morning setting so he wouldn't have to cancel or delay his regular Wednesday general audience in St. Peter's Square. I don't want to diss the people. Couldn't find any other time for the president of the free world. And then because of the gathering crowd, the President of the United States was ushered into the palace through a small side entrance used by Vatican employees. Then during the meet and greet with the Trump entourage, the Pope proceeded to make a little joke, a fat joke, at our President's expense, asking Mrs. Trump, what do you give him to eat? Potika? And laugh, she's Hungarian or Slovenian. She's Slovenian. And this is one of their dishes. Potika is an not even debatable fattening dessert or dish. Of the subsequent private meetings that followed, with only a translator present, the communique issued by the Vatican indicates that discussion between the two men ranged from a from areas of presumed agreement having to do with the sanctity of life, uh, the freedom of religion and conscience, the peace, the protection of Christian communities in the Middle East, 
to those of presumed disagreement, health care, and assistance to immigrants. The communique makes no mention of climate change or whether uh, Trump will pull out of the U.S. or pull the U.S. out of the 2015 Paris Agreement, but we might be able to infer that Frank Francis was sending a message by giving Trump a copy of his climate change encyclia, a political pope. Popular hip-hop artist, most notably Kendrick Lamar, whose stage name is Chance the Rapper, and Kanye West are weaving Christian themes into their music without apology. And surprisingly, or maybe not so surprisingly, the secular music marketplace is eating it up. But just as mainstream rap has become more Christianized, Christian rap is becoming more mainstream. Artists like Lecrae, I have no idea, people, I read this stuff, are signing with secular music labels and refusing to be called Christian rappers. Now, no such thing as Christian rap. I'm sorry. Many other prominent Christian artists are releasing records that focus more on political commentary than preaching and are incorporating provocative lyrics that may easily offend conservative Christian fans. I say, surprise, you do know that many, if not most, of those who make it big in the Christian music world are not really Christians the way you and I think of Christians, right? I mean, there's a sizable percentage of these people that drink, they do drugs, they have sex, they have babies with other people, they use vulgar language. And they don't seem to make a whole lot of apology for this stuff. Now they get caught having a baby, that's different. But, you know, if they're just out there having a good time and they, they maybe get drunk or they have a, a, a drink here or that, they don't have a problem with that. Or if they slip the tongue and the language, they never tell you. Christian music, so-called, in the last 50 years has been little else than a doorway to the secular popularity and wealth that this kind of music can bring. Hate to bust your bubble. The familiar image of Europe is fading quickly. In just a few decades, we'll look back on Christian values, demo democratic principles, freedom of belief, equality of gender, and respect for individual rights as echoes of a glorious European past. And the enemy? Islam. The means? not a shot being fired in a military effort. Yet in very few generations, Islam will overwhelm the European continent, completely eliminating the French, the German, the Swedish, the British, and a host of other nations' cultures and corporate existence. The multiplication of children is enough to accomplish this in just a few short decades. And that's without factoring in the onslaught of Islamic immigrants. All of this is a deliberate demographic shift, part of a long-term strategy that Islamists recognize and proudly boast of to the world. Immigration is a part of the equation, but equally important are the higher birth rates of Muslim families that tend to have more children. The total population increase on the planet between 2010 and 2050 is projected to be 35%. The increase in the number of Christians is placed at 35%. Hindus, 34%. Jews, 16%. Folk religions, 11%. Those unaffiliated and all the other religions put together, 15%. Muslim population, it is expected it will grow at a rate of 73%. And that's just in the next 40 years. Some of you will live long enough to see it. We're even fostering Islamic culture in our schools and communities here in this country. We view it as friendly. Some people view it as being Christian. But when it begins to boil, it will destroy the existing culture very quickly. 
Islam is not Christianity. Islam never, ever makes a culture better. It merely makes it Muslim, a harsh, violent, degrading culture, one ruled by violence and repression, the men enjoying tremendous benefit at the expense of women and children, and also non-Muslims. And the society is quickly plunged into a 7th century model. The light of the glorious gospel goes out and the darkness of all that's evil and repressive descends. These are some of the things that passed by us this week. Maybe you caught them, maybe you didn't, but I didn't want you to miss them.